what does it mean to be sane? How reliably can even medical professionals distinguish the sane from the insane? Psychologist David Rosenhan of Stanford University had long been interested in these age-old questions and, in 1969, devised a unique experiment to put them to the test. To investigate how situational factors affect a diagnosis of schizophrenia, sane confederates went into psychiatric hospitals and told medical health professionals they had a hallucination. They observed whether staff would realize that they were sane. If staff did not detect their sanity, it would have implications for the current methods of diagnosing mental illness. Eight confederates acted as pseudo-patients and went to 12 different hospitals. The real participants were the hospital staff who did not know about the experiment. These pseudo-patients consisted of three women and five men, including Rosenhan himself, whose occupations ranged from actual psychologist to painter. The participants assumed false names and professions and were instructed to set up appointments at the hospitals and claim that they had been hearing strange voices muttering words like empty and hollow. They said that the voices were unclear, unfamiliar and of the same sex as the pseudo-patient. On the basis of these appointments, every single pseudo-patient was admitted to the hospital that they contacted. Pseudo-patients gave false names, occupations and symptoms, but gave real-life histories. Once on the ward, the pseudo-patients stopped pretending to have symptoms, behaved normally and wrote observations. Pseudo-patients were discharged only when they convinced staff that they were sane. According to the landmark 1973 report that Rosenhan published about his experiment, none of the pseudo-patients really believed that they would be admitted so easily. Not only was every pseudo-patient admitted, but all except one received a diagnosis of schizophrenia. The other diagnosis was manic depressive psychosis. At the start of the experiment, the patient's biggest concern was that they would be immediately exposed as frauds and greatly embarrassed. But as it turned out, there was no need to worry on this account. After they had been admitted to the psychiatric ward, the pseudo-patients stopped simulating any symptoms of abnormality. The pseudo-patients took part in ward activities, speaking to patients and staff as they might ordinarily. When asked how they were feeling by staff they said they were fine and no longer experienced symptoms. Each pseudo-patient had been told they would have to get out by their own devices by convincing staff they were sane. Rosenhan instructed the pseudo-patients to take notes on their experiences. Initially this was done secretly although as it became clear that no one was bothered the note-taking was done more openly. Hospital staff would observe totally normal behavior on the part of the pseudo-patients and characterize it as abnormal. For example, nurse who observed this note-taking wrote in a daily report that the patient engages in writing behavior. Another example of where behavior was misinterpreted by staff as stemming from within the patient, rather than the environment, was when a psychiatrist pointed to a group of patients waiting outside the cafeteria half an hour before lunchtime. The psychiatrist suggested that such behavior was characteristic of an oral acquisitive syndrome. However, a more likely explanation would be that the patients had little to do, and one of the few things to anticipate in a psychiatric hospital is a meal. As Rosenhan saw it, doctors and staff would assume that their diagnosis was correct and work backward from there, reframing everything they observed so that it would be in harmony with that diagnosis. And in addition to stubbornly sticking to their diagnoses, hospital staff would treat the pseudo-patients coldly. Interactions with the staff ranged from disinterested at best to abusive at worst. Even when the pseudo-patients attempted to engage with staff in a friendly, conversational manner, responses were brief. 
but while hospital staff treated the pseudo patients poorly and never realized they were faking, the actual patients often had no trouble detecting them. When the researchers were able to keep track, 35 out of 118 actual patients blatantly accused the pseudo patients of faking, with some outright stating, you're not crazy. You're a journalist or a professor. The pseudo patients remained in hospital for 7 to 52 days. The average was 19 days. Many psychiatrists all over the country expressed anger against Rosenhan and his study. One of the hospitals got in touch with Rosenham and asked him to send them pseudo patients without a forewarning. Their claim was that what happened in other hospitals would never happen in theirs, and they could certainly tell if a patient was faking their symptoms. In the following three months, the hospital administration suspected that 41 of the newly admitted 193 patients were pseudo patients. 19 were decided to be perfectly sane. Rosenham later revealed that he had sent no one. Rosenhan wrote, it is clear that we cannot distinguish the sane from the insane in psychiatric hospitals. But what can be said of the 19 people who were suspected of being sane by one psychiatrist and another staff member? There is no way of knowing. But one thing is certain, any diagnostic process that lends itself too readily to massive errors of this sort cannot be a very reliable one.